What if I told you that 27 years ago you could have visited a place that, had it existed today, some dude on CNBC would have called it the metaverse? What if I told you that it was actually cool, but like the hipster version of Second Life? Well, welcome to Active Worlds. Uh, look, I know it doesn't look like much, but trust me, there's a lot of good here. I've been mentioning Active Worlds a lot in my videos, or rather I've just kind of been gesturing at it while never really mentioning it by name. I did talk about it briefly in my very first video, but it was hardly the star of the show. If you've heard of Active Worlds at all, it's probably because you're the sort of person who just idly browses random Wikipedia pages. Or maybe you just watch a lot of those weird YouTube channels like Vine Sauce that treat every single thing they find as it's the spookiest or weirdest thing on the entire internet. Alternatively, you might just be like me, someone who spent years of their life in this particular virtual reality. So much of who I am is because in 1999, I stumbled on a link to a 3D virtual world on a dog's fan site, and I just wanted to go check it out. That moment, clicking that single link, might have been one of the most singularly impactful things to ever have happened to me. But I'm gonna guess that you probably have no idea what it is, so let me give you the briefest introduction. Active Worlds is a social proto-virtual reality program released in 1995, where users could create their own content entirely within the app. No external tools were necessary at all. Basically think of something like Second Life, except way crispier around the edges. Active Worlds was very much born of the age of chat rooms. It was, spiritually at least, the 3D version of IRC. It was also clearly influenced by cyberpunk literature. This was cutting edge software at the time, and was the first real attempt at recreating Snow Crash's metaverse. As a program, it's held up about as well as an AS400 terminal in a bombed out Sears. This is indeed one of the reasons why it's been associated with weird YouTuber creepypasta. It looks like something built from the age it was from. Well, that wouldn't be weird for architecture or book covers or comic books or basically any type of art ever. In the realm of the digital, old things tend to disappear, consumed by silicon rot. While things like Second Life look, well, old, they've at least been graphically updated over the years, whereas Active Worlds hasn't. While new features have been added, they're mostly things like you can have animated objects in the world, and you can make lens flares now, more than any serious rebuilding of the platform's graphical engine. And that's not really surprising when you dig into any history about AW's creation or its brief stint in anything resembling relevance. Active Worlds was essentially the end result of a side project started by Ron Britvich before he joined Worlds Inc., which itself was a pre.com era spin-off of Peregrine Systems, a company that would get absorbed into HP in the early 2000s. As a sidebar, I feel like absorbed by HP is probably the bad end in a startup dating sim set during Y2K. At Worlds Inc., Britvich continued to develop what would become Active Worlds. But even within that company, it struggled to get any serious attention. Worlds Inc. was developing another 3D chat program called Worlds Chat that, unlike Active Worlds, was primarily targeted at corporate partners rather than individual users. I actually used it, and I have no idea why it was the golden child. I mean, I, I do. It appealed to corporate interests, but man, it sucked. But hey, the website for it is still active, so that's something. Active Worlds did find an audience, though, of some sort. Its biggest gimmick, the fact that all of the content was built by users, was unlike anything that had come before it. It was a truly revolutionary feature, and because of it, Active Worlds quickly developed a cult following. Shortly after the program launched, a small studio was formed to create content for the app, called Circle of Fire. Circle of Fire is responsible for much of the content that you've seen in my videos. They built a recreation of Snow Crash's metaverse, an entire world on Mars, along with a bunch of other things. Now, a brief tangent about creation in Active Worlds. In AW, you build things out of objects. These objects aren't just basic geometrical shapes like, say, in a 3D modeling program, but rather actual objects. Things like walls, doors, poles, streets, and so on can be called up by their name. You can then duplicate them and then do basic stuff like change their color, put a texture on them, or rotate them. These basic objects are all predefined models that are pulled from an external database, basically a file server that contains something called an object path. 
Each world in Active Worlds has its own object path that defines the building blocks of that world. Additionally, the only way you can figure this out and figure out what objects you can use in a world is to go to something called a building or object yard, which is basically just a display of all the tools afforded to you. So for example, in the metaverse world, you can only build stuff that looks like this. On Mars, same deal. In Alpha World, which we'll talk more about in a second, you don't have access to those other objects and instead have stuff that looks more normal. If you purchased and hosted your own world, you'd have to also host your own object path somewhere, which you could then customize, adding your own textures, models, and so on, provided you could get your hand on them, something that was significantly more difficult to do in the 90s. Many of these objects were modeled by Circle of Fire, and in that way, they left a permanent mark on Active Worlds itself. Likewise, they were also responsible for building content in Active Worlds, essentially showing the community what could be done and guiding their hand. But yeah, okay, back to the history. Earlier, I had mentioned that Worlds Chat went out against Active Worlds internally, and while that's true, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It turns out Active Worlds was being developed as a replacement for Worlds Chat, before Worlds Chat had even been released to the public. It's just that the replacement failed to garner any energy inside the company. For something in the mid-90s, it just required too much bandwidth and too much computing power to run for most users. Likewise, corporate partners outside of the Norwegian government seemed to just not be interested. This seemingly led Worlds Inc. to charging ahead with Worlds Chat as the platform of choice. They left beta, or what was referred to as the demo, and launched Worlds Chat Gold 1.0, which did not go well. The company they'd hired to manage sales didn't have a product to ship to customers until two weeks after the release date. They didn't even have a proper bank account set up. When the product finally made it to users' hands, they found that they couldn't use custom avatars and that they were locked into a single username. While Worlds Inc. did release some bug fixes, the team mostly went silent with users unable to get even so much as troubleshooting help from the company. The bad launch, plus the seemingly split attention of their development team, had finally broken the company. In 1997, after a series of layoffs and an attempt to hold on to Worlds Chat, the company offloaded Active Worlds to Circle of Fire Studios. Circle of Fire, who was run by Richard Knoll at the time, purchased all of Active Worlds' assets, hired most of the developers of the project, and pulled on in another investor named JP McCormick. This fundamentally made Active Worlds an independent product in an independent company. A good thing, theoretically, but as someone that was there, it was eh, the start of many problems. For one, server stability was an early, big problem. Horrifically so. Before Worlds Inc. tossed the project off to Circle of Fire, the entire database was destroyed, erasing all of the community's progress. This was a devastating blow, one that the community only managed to get past by mythologizing it as a virtual and natural disaster. Likewise, development of the client itself was slow at best. While I'm not a developer, I think it's pretty telling that the client has remained basically identical for 25 years. Early community meetings were free-for-alls where developers would be screeched at by power users and it seemed like any planned and hyped up features would become vaporware by the very next meeting. Looking back at the features that were promised and added in is kind of something else. Whispering, presentations and classes. While whispering was quickly added in, presentations wouldn't make it into the program until 2009, well after most users had already abandoned the app. Having been passed around so much, it was clear that there was a lack of direction for what AW wanted to be. This was also apparent in how they monetized. Originally, this was done through citizenships, which you could purchase for $20 a year. Becoming a citizen of Active Worlds meant you would be able to use more avatars. When you would talk and chat, your messages would be black instead of gray, and probably most importantly, no one could delete your buildings. Yes, as a tourist or an unregistered user, Anything you build could be deleted by other users. And believe me, people would absolutely hunt down and delete your stuff if you weren't a citizen. It was griefing as a monetization strategy. While they'd bring in tens of thousands of users this way, the revenue either just wasn't enough for them to sustain themselves, or they just weren't seeing adequate growth. This meant that they needed to create more ways for users to hand over their coin. So they brought out worlds. To have your own, you'd have to buy a license. This, as you can guess, was not cheap. Licenses required a one-time fee of $70, 
with an additional annual registration fee on top of that. This scaled with how big a world was, as well as how many people could go inside of it. While this started pretty cheap at 10 bucks, that was for a tiny world that only five people could visit at once. For a world larger than a thimble, you'd be paying easily over $500. That was just the license fee. Hosting was even more expensive. You'd easily double the yearly cost if you chose to use Active Worlds' own servers. And then there were universe servers. This was where AW hoped to make the most money. These servers were designed to run as independent mini Active Worlds's. Imagine, for example, if VRChat sold a version of VRChat to another company, say Nike, and then charged them monthly for that license. These were astronomical in cost, at least for late 90s money, ranging from 10 to $60,000 a year. These were always kind of a joke among the player base, as it was hard to imagine a major company wanting to buy one, not just because of the cost, but because universes were so separate from the rest of Active Worlds, no one would even know that they existed. No users would be aware of it at all, and you'd have to do that work yourself. Essentially, you were paying a ton of money to literally have no customers. It was a bizarre choice. I think Earthlink might have bought one? Totally weird. But the demand for revenue growth didn't just impact corporate partners. Over time, Active Worlds would become more expensive. Citizenships ballooned from $20 a year to $70, and the company even tried to put out 3D web pages. I feel comfortable saying that these, too, also truly sucked, and showed that the company had little idea why people were gravitating towards their program in the first place. Now, the early mid 2000s are when I lost interest in Active Worlds for the most part, so I missed the next step of the company's monetization strategy. But from what I understand, in 2008 they released a credit system, got rid of citizenship fees, and instead tried to basically use a Second Life-like program to make money. At this point though, you're asking users to spend money on something that looked like this. Now, this isn't a tell-all. I'm, I'm not bringing you the deepest, most silt and clay-rich dirt on pre-traveling without moving internet-based startups. Instead, I'm just trying to give you some background on a cool thing. So it's with that preamble that I say the following. From the outside looking in, Active World seemed like a company that was perpetually struggling to find investors. Or perhaps they wanted complete control of their baby and refused to let anyone even glimpse the slightest iota of design influence. I don't know. All I know is that somewhere between this time of revenue growth, it seemed like all active development progress more or less ceased or at least ground to a halt in a professional sense. Okay, so I know I complained about it for 12 minutes straight now, but don't be fooled. Despite all of its struggles, Active Worlds absolutely slaps. While it clearly had a rocky life, there's no doubt it was ludicrously ahead of its time. I mean, come on, this was developed in 1995. Broadband wasn't even a thing for most people yet. The very concept of user belt content making up basically everything by itself is pretty incredible in this era, especially considering the complete freedom developers gave users to make whatever they could within the program systems. They were creating systems and facing design challenges that no one had, nor had they seen anything remotely similar. For example, how do you prevent people from trolling each other and building ugly things on top of one another? Well, you have a land claiming system. If you build something, no one can build something above or below that piece of land. That means that people will just claim out plots for themselves to ensure that they can essentially have their own little virtual homestead without worrying about someone building, I don't know, a 30 foot tall penis or something. And for the most part, they were really good at making choices that empower their community to build itself. There's a lot of cool meta design stuff here. Some really interesting bits of emergent communities and gameplay. The place I'm in now is just one small part of SW City, a large sprawling nation-sized city in Alpha World that's complete with basically everything you could imagine a real city having. That wasn't designed for, they just gave people the tools to build something cool like that. Likewise, the developers created a platform that was just open enough for users to do things like create their own upgraded texture packs, or even to build mini games using bots or by taking advantage of the built-in web browser. AW's developers truly embodied the give them the tools and let them build it ethos. This was that philosophy's testing ground, way before it would make it to Second Life or a more modern equivalent like VRChat. 
Speaking of good decisions, one of the best they made was the creation of one world I just mentioned, Alpha World. At some point, they decided to create an absolutely massive world, one with the dimensions of the metaverse in Snow Crash. It's huge, way larger than any other. This meant that everyone could go find space and build whatever they wanted, but at the same time do so in the company of others. Since the game used Cartesian coordinates, you'd spawn in at 0 north, 0 east, or ground zero, as it was referred to in Active Worlds. While you could build anywhere, most people would try to get a good spot close to the spawn, and so that particular area grew exponentially, much like the center of a major city. It's crowded and chaotic and full of all sorts of weird things that are hard to explain but made perfect sense at the time. It feels a bit like a chunk of digital amber, preserving ages of internet history more or less just as they were when they were created. And that's kind of special, especially now. Ever since the internet was a thing, there has been this concept called link rot. Basically, as the internet evolves, pages die. Those links to those pages, to that information, then go dark. If you do find an old page on the internet, there's a good chance that none of the links on it will work. Considering search engine tech evolved to use links as part of their ranking algorithm, this also means that the more links die, the more sites become isolated. Sites that were once easy to find become desert islands, marooned in an impossibly vast ocean, never to be seen or remembered again, maybe not even by their creators. As a denizen of the early internet, it's so strange to think back to that time, to that version of the internet. I never realized as a kid how ephemeral that space was. Most, if not all, of the websites I'd checked daily have been vaporized, long turned back to zero, any remnant long since crushed into sand and falling through one hourglass or another. Many of the sites as a kid that got me into anime, writing, history, anything, were hosted on college servers, on long clunky URLs. That sort of thing was just expected, it was normal. That's where all the best stuff was. And yet, with time, those sites were pulled offline, long forgotten by the college students that once ran them. Unlike the collaborative internet that we're used to today, things back then were often made by one person, hosted by one person, and maintained by one person. If that person lost interest, it'd all be gone. And so much of that era has been lost to time because of that. Say one thing about Facebook or Twitter or what have you, they sure don't want you to be easy to forget, for better or worse. And so often I feel like the 90s and early 2000s are very much akin to a dark age. The people that studied it or lived in it might know that the descriptor dark doesn't fit, but from the outside looking in, it's all missing. It's a void. But Active Worlds is a special case. The users that made these creations are long gone, but the things they made still stand. I doubt they've logged in anytime recently or even not recently. Some of the buildings you're looking at have been here for 27 years. There's a very good chance that there are creations here in this virtual world that are older than some of the people watching this video. In fact, I can almost guarantee that's the case. And that feels just so weird to me. This feels historical in some way. Like I almost want to dial up archive.org and yell at them to put this entire place in a database or something. I feel a deep sense of anxiety for what could just be lost in a server crash or if whoever is still churning along at the top here decides it just isn't worth it anymore. For me, this portal back in time is inherently more personal too. More than 4chan or something awful or Tumblr, or YouTube, or any of the many games I'd play after, it was the place that fundamentally formed me into who I am. This is where I sucked up most of the internet culture that formed my sense of humor. It's where I learned what role-playing was, what creative writing was, and that I couldn't even do it. God, the innocence. I can remember young Straz, so eager to meet people that really liked dogs and cats, and just really wanted to talk about them. A long line in a series of topics that I'd struggle perpetually to find anyone to talk to about. When I was 10 years old, I'd hang out in chat rooms and talk to people lying about my age and saying I was 15 or 16, which felt light years away to me. Just that desire to find anyone to talk to about these things I cared about churning in my brain that no one else seemed to understand at the time. The curse of a kid whose brain had been exposed to the internet, to anime or video games, and an era where those things were rare. Or maybe I just existed in the most boring possible location in space-time. 
As a brief aside here, I'm 32 and I am a millennial. I'm, I'm sorry. You should have known that by now. One of the generational divides that I've struggled to understand is the perception of age and youth and how much that's changed since I was there. Nowadays, it seems that the paranoia that was beaten into our heads as kids by our parents about us being, I don't know, abducted and tossed into a van by someone we met in passing in a fish enthusiast chat room has somehow completely passed through us and epigenetically landed in the generation below us. Like whenever I see someone scream, I am a minor, do not interact with me, I am 14 or something. Uh, I can just, I can think back to how embarrassed I would have be that anyone would know my real age or that I was too young for a conversation or whatever. But yeah, dogs. I was, I was finally happy to meet people that liked the stuff that I did. By the time I convinced my parents to let me finally download Active Worlds on their computer though, it was too late. The world that fansite had run in Active Worlds was gone. And so I found myself wandering this space as a bird, because birds are cute, looking for a home. And I found it among a very friendly Pokemon based community. They do virtual gym battles, which were essentially just the TCG, but through chat bots. It was in these communities that I was first exposed to JRPGs and video games past what I'd read about in Nintendo Power. It was a wild world. Someone even told me about SimCity 2000 and Command and Conquer, which I also had to beg my parents to buy me. I was obsessed with building, with creating stuff. That obsession would pour over to different aspects of Active Worlds too. For example, there was an SDK in the game that would allow for you to create bots that could do a bunch of random things, from just simple chatbots to more complex tasks. I wanted to make my own, and so I ended up learning Visual Basic, which was my introduction to programming. I think it would be fair to say that before touching Active Worlds, I was just a normal, weird kid. But after it, I was put into a railgun and blasted deep into the internet. The sonic reverations from my stupid, small, sickly body being propelled through the code of the only metaverse that matters could be traced like a precise map, inevitably leading to the weird Dragon Girl VTuber video SAS dude that I am today. This place is empty now. From just looking at world populations, there's never more than 15 or 20 people online on a good day, but even that feels like a small miracle. The fact that even after all these years in a game that looks like this, that feels like this, the controls are pretty wonky, people still lurk here. At one time there used to be hundreds of people in just one world. In Alpha World, you'd have these huge independent communities. Someone would build roads, buildings, and so on, and then other people would just come and join them. A giant co-op project akin to a big Minecraft build or something all with a set of social rules that manifested out of a desire to make something neat. The largest one of those communities was SW City, a place I've previously mentioned, and a place that I called home for a long time. I can still go back to that place and find old things I made, artifacts to my younger self, so, so long ago. I had made websites for myself around this time, but they're all long gone hosted on servers that have long since been mothballed and then probably ground into mothballs. Yet this data still remains. It kind of feels like returning to the house you grew up in after leaving for decades. You drive by the street and everything feels familiar and almost eerie. You see things you've forgotten, things that you don't immediately have any memory of, but a stray photon plinks your retina from an odd angle. You turn your neck and you witness something that lights up neurons long dormant. And Man, I don't know. Maybe this just looks so old and crusty, worn out and boring to you, but I think that you should come here. Maybe not here to this exact space I'm looking at, but just like here in general. This is the closest thing to a real museum of the internet, or at least a place in it that exists in a living, breathing form. This isn't an archive, it still stands. It's a historical village for the cyberspace age. You can visit this place and glide through streets built by the imaginations of people that have long forgotten any of this exists. In nooks and alleys, you'll find references to things you don't understand, etchings left by a digital civilization long buried by the endless march of technological progress. You can come here and wander for hours, days or weeks even, just looking at stuff people made, people you'll never meet, and who probably don't even remember making it. And to me, that's kind of beautiful, but that's, not to say that it's all still here. 
While the software architects of the space constructed AlphaWorld as a place that was fundamentally always going to be like this, they also, as I previously mentioned, allowed users to make their own worlds. These places were often even more chaotic than this one. They hosted hundreds, even thousands of internet communities that all have their own vibrant and exciting stories, likely even including the dogs one that was sucked into the void before I ever could find it. As they were all hosted on individual private servers, they're all gone now, they're lost. It creates an interesting view of this whole thing. As someone that was here that knew this place and the culture around it, it's a little odd seeing videos by creators talking about it. They're performing a sort of digital archeology, span digging deep and finding artifacts that they dust off and then proclaim to be representative of some culture that is beyond ancient to them. That lets them create a warped view of what was once this digital reality, and that's kinda, I don't know, it makes me feel something and it isn't really good. Like I've always bristled against these videos that tend to exoticize virtual worlds and communities in the most dramatic ways. No places are ever normal, no places are just ever places, they are always haunted, spooky, deviant, weird, or just fucked up in whatever way is the most narratively interesting. I often wonder what people think of say, VRChat or Neos or any of this wave of social VR programs 25 years in the future? Will the videos that have been created, will the art that's left, make people think that it was something else, something different? I wonder about the videos pointing out the dark side, or these creepypastas, or the horniest, weirdest corners of any platform. And I wonder if, as time passes, if they become representative of a caricature of a place instead of the completely normal people who just wanted to make friends there. In the same way, watching this video or even experiencing Active Worlds now is to see only a fraction of what it once was. So you'll just have to believe me when I say that this place had hundreds of communities, thousands of people who logged on daily, who lived in this virtual world, who made lifelong friends here, who I have to imagine if they're anything like me, still occasionally even dream of it. And yeah, you know what? There was incredibly weird stuff too. There were NSFW worlds that popped up and created fractures in the community because people deemed them to be too weird. Go look up Gorian culture. While every article talks at length about Second Life, Active Worlds is where that culture got its real start in virtual worlds. Part of me wonders if YouTube existed back then, if that would be the element of Active Worlds that we just remember and nothing else. There was just so much here now that's lost. Role-playing communities and cities and building competitions, much in the same way that VR Chat's music scene probably will leave a mark on underground music. I wonder how many architects got their start because they just wanted to put a goofy house together in this weird place. At the same time I'm writing this though, I can feel it all getting away from me. I think that with video essays like this one, there's a tempting impulse to want to title it, say, the virtual world that started it all or something. The most influential program of all time, you know, something like that. It'd be easy to look at all the usage of avatars, of user-generated content, of digital real estate, of virtual malls and everything else and obviously connect the dots to everything that came after. It'd be easy to be lazy, to get out my purple crayon and just start whipping out a line from ground zero to horizon. But I'm gonna be honest here, I don't really think Active Worlds was the genesis of any of those things. While it might have been the first in many ways, it was also almost immediately forgotten. Active Worlds, even in its time, was never talked about outside of small internet circles. It never penetrated the mainstream. It would be challenging to even say that it earned cult status because, I mean, really it didn't. A bolder, more click-focused YouTuber would probably say, this was the first metaverse, and honestly I feel the fact that I didn't include that godforsaken word anywhere in the title is proof that I don't really care if my content rots as much as any of these virtual spaces have. Active World certainly was ahead of its time though, that much is absolutely true. It, and the people that made it, deserve much more recognition than they've ever gotten. The ideas that they had, even if they didn't reverberate through the internet when they built them, clearly had a future. It just wasn't here. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't visit, at least while you still can.